Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry we are running late in the program, but we're very happy to start this conversation with all of you. And a warm welcome to all of those who are joining us live globally from so many different parts of the world. I have a particular thought for all the young people who are connecting today to this side event on scaling up due diligence on child labor. I'm sure that all of you, all of young people connecting to this call would have a lot to say and a lot to bring to this conversation. My name is Catherine Torres. I have the pleasure to work at the International Labor Organization in Geneva and the pleasure to be your moderator today. This event has been organized by a group of people committed to end child labor. The ILO Child Labor Platform that brings businesses across sectors to fight against child labor in supply chains with a cross-sectoral approach, looking at knowledge sharing and looking at practical solutions on the ground. And we have two co-chairs that have come on board to organize this side event. The International Organization of Employers, most famously known as IOE, and the International Trade Union Federation, most famously known as ITUC. We also have partnered with the UN Global Compact, and I want to say a big thank you to our colleagues from the UN Global Compact who have made this event possible as well with their contribution. Some of you might have followed what has happened during these first days of the conference, on this fifth conference on the elimination of child labor. And I want to say that if you have followed those first days, you will know perfectly well that actually today's side event comes just at the right time. Possibly we couldn't have had this conversation on a scaling up due diligence five years ago and not even three years ago. And I want to highlight three things why this conversation today is actually timely and important. Why the scale up due diligence on child labor is timely for us today. The first um, reason and the first trend, and we have heard a lot from different high-level speakers in previous days, there is a growing number of companies coming on board to do their due diligence on child labor. We have big companies, more and more big companies, but we also have SMEs taking, uh, ready to take their share responsibility, ready to take and to be part of the solution. So there is a trend of more and more companies ready to step up, to take the responsibility, to be part of, of the solution. The second trend that is really, really important, and this is a shift that you can see in many companies that have been engaged for many years on the issue of child labor, is that we are moving slowly, but we're getting there from a reactive approach to tackle child labor in supply chains to more preventive approach, looking at the real root causes of child labor and for companies to understand that the investment and their contribution to tackle those root causes is really strategic to make their, their, their supply chain more resilient and sustainable. So we are going into a more holistic approach on how we look at child labor in supply chains. We are scaling up our ambition on the topics that we are covering uh, to end child labor in supply chain. And last but not least, we are not starting from scratch. Many of you are currently working on very important, successful experiences to tackle child labor in supply chains, to identify, to prevent, to mitigate, and to remediate child labor in numerous and across sectors of, of different supply chains. So we want to scale up those very successful pilot experiments, initiatives, not to cover and benefit just a hundred of children, which is already extremely valuable, but to cover thousands and the million of children that remain on child labor. So we are not starting from scratch. We are ready to scale up. I want to invite you, all of you, all of you who are joining us here in the room, those who are joining us through Zoom, to contribute to the conversation. We're going to have time for your questions, time for your comments. My colleague Marilu Dupont from UN Global Compact will come to the room and bring the voices of our audience and bring those questions to the speaker. So please remain engaged, send us your topics, send us the contributions you want to have. And if my message about scaling up is actually echoing what you feel, what you're doing on the ground, what you're doing globally, Share with us why do you think also that is a timely moment to speak about that. If you actually think that it should not, it's not yet the right moment to speak about scaling up, 
also share with you your contributions or your remarks on this. I, I want just to finalize by saying, or just finalize my opening remarks by saying that we will be uh, continuing this conversation through the ILO Child Labor Platform. So I, I call you all of you to remain in touch and alert to what the ILO Child Labor Platform is doing. It's important to, to continue this conversation and the work after Durban. As the DG, Director General of the ILO, mentioned in, her, in his opening remarks, what happens after Durban is the key. Okay, so without any further ado, we have two speakers that really wanted to send a message to all of us today. They couldn't make it in person, they couldn't make it in, in, in virtually, but they really wanted to send a message to the audience and, and, and to our speakers today. So I want to give uh, the floor through pre-recorded videos to His Excellency Lise Schemacher, Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation of the Netherlands, and those who are following the work of Alliance 8.7 know well that the Netherlands is one of the developed countries to be a pathfinder country of Alliance 8.7. So the Netherlands has committed to go further and faster to end child labor, including and particularly with a robust approach on supply chains. And our second high-level speaker, and I'm very pleased to also have have her with us is Sanda Ojambo, Assistant Secretary General and CEO of the UN Global Compact. So we're going to listen to them and then we come back. Distinguished guests, we are convening here today because we all recognize the complex problem of child labor. 160 million children are still working in fields or in mines. The COVID-19 lockdowns made the situation worse, as UNICEF has reported. We are not on track to achieve the SDG 8.7. So we need to take action urgently on the root causes, on solutions that improve lives, and on achieving impact at scale. We've decided to target three issues. First, a living income for parents, improving their working conditions, their productivity, their skills and knowledge, and of course, their quality of life. Secondly, improving the enabling environment. This means better international and local regulations and enforcing these through stricter labor inspections. And third, we are working to make supply chains sustainable through partnerships with companies. Companies must and can take responsibility, and it's something they should want to do. We've established the Dutch Fund Against Child Labour to provide leverage for companies that want to invest in and innovate for structural solutions. The solutions can be very practical. A Dutch company in the rice sector promoted fair working conditions. It improved free medical assistance to workers, which reduced households' healthcare expenditure. It also resulted in fewer workers being sick and increased their productivity, meaning they saved money and their income increased, so that they could send their children to school instead of making them go to work. I believe these kinds of practical and scalable solutions in the supply chain will help reduce poverty and thus help eliminate child labor. Just consider what's possible if we are all dedicated and willing to make a change. Together we can accomplish so much more. And this is something the Netherlands strongly believes in. And it's what we advocate as an Alliance 8.7 Pathfinder country. We need all governments to work together more closely and learn from each other. We need businesses to be truly willing to change, to be conscious of risks and address possible abuses. We need legislation on responsible business conduct, creating the right environment for innovative, sustainable businesses and for holding businesses accountable for the negative impacts they cause in their supply chain just as we need the involvement of local suppliers at the start of the supply chain, where child labor is most common. Because right now, we often see an unfair value distribution in supply chains. So let's work together in supply chains to achieve an enabling environment, a living income for adults and good working conditions, to prevent and eliminate child labor globally once and for all. Thank you. 
Warm greetings to you all. I'm Sando Jambo, Assistant Secretary General and CEO of the United Nations Global Compact. The UN Global Compact is a special initiative of the United Nations Secretary General, and the Compact works with more than 15,000 business participants who are committed to aligning their operations with our 10 principles that are centered around human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. Many of the distinguished speakers and participants gathered this week in Durban have already sounded the alarm. One in five children in Africa are in child labor, and almost one in 10 of all children worldwide. This is deeply concerning. No child should be deprived of a childhood, safety, health, or education. Child labor has no place in our society, and companies have a duty to stop it. Ending child and forced labor is integral to the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. Our participating companies are committed to stopping these abuses. However, most companies have yet to move beyond policy commitments to take concrete actions to end child labor. So a wide gap between business aspiration and action still persists. Part of the problem is that child labor is often deeply entrenched in supply chains or linked to informal work and companies may in fact be indirectly involved in child labor without even knowing it. As child labor is a multifaceted challenge, understanding its root causes is critical to making a real impact. And such causes include inadequate wages for parents, limited educational opportunities for children, and inaccessible social protection systems. So adopting a holistic approach is crucial to addressing these issues and stopping child labor even before it starts. To create more long-term solutions, we urge companies to step up their human rights due diligence efforts to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address actual and potential adverse human rights impacts. Not only in their own operations, but within their supply chain and other business relationships as well. By incorporating a child rights perspective within their due diligence processes, companies can act to put an end to child labor. There are specific actions that companies of all sizes and from all sectors can take. Buyers, for example, can look more carefully at the policies and practices of their suppliers and provide them an enabling environment through responsible procurement practices. Special attention needs to be paid to small and medium enterprises operating in the lower tiers of supply chains where labor risks are often more pronounced because they face additional barriers in the fight against child labor. What will it take to accelerate progress on child labor? It'll take collaboration among all stakeholders, as well as ambitious commitments, transparency, and accountability. Toward this end, the UN Global Compact's enhanced communication on progress, which is being rolled out this year, can help companies showcase their progress on eliminating child labor throughout their value chains. The private sector has the capacity to take action and be leaders of change, acting to eliminate child labor for good. And the UN Global Compact is here to work side by side with the business community because united, we can build a better world. Thank you. Many thanks to our distinguished speakers, and I think they really make the point on a few topics that we will be discussing today. Just to give a number, and again, this number is important, one in 10 children remain in child labor. This is a wake-up call for all of those who are not yet on board on this fight, one in 10 children in 2022. Another important topic I take from the, our distinguished speakers is the importance for businesses to drive and lead this change. There is so much innovation and power within the business community to help us to make it happen, and many of them are getting on board. And finally, I think there were both very similar comments on the importance to go really deep in the supply chain where the risks are the highest on child labor, looking at the extraction and at the production of raw material, working with SMEs and local suppliers, building their capacity. So thanks a lot for our distinguished speakers to set in the tone of, of this conversation. And now let's go a little bit deeper on what's happening on due diligence. Let's have a look at what are the most 
uh, recent efforts to understand what our company is doing on child labor due diligence. And for that, I have the pleasure to welcome to this floor Colleen Terran. Colleen, thank you so much for joining us here in Durban. You actually flew uh, to be with all of us in, in this meeting. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the IOE. Um, we um, think I'm about to share some of the findings of a collaborative effort that we have undertaken, um, doing some research around effective due diligence for at addressing child labor. Um, I'm just going to move to yes. the podium, please, if, Colleen. if I can. And Colleen, um, while you move to the podium, I, I want to say that you are actually leading RDA International. You're the executive director of RDA International. So we're happy that you actually managed to take the time to be with us today in, in, in such important and, and, and I'm sure time consuming position. So we are hearing and we are very much looking forward to, to hear about your recent efforts on, on the research that you just uh, Thank you to. so much. That's, it's such a privilege to be here today. And, um, and just as, as some background, uh, my name is Colleen Teron. I'm actually from Pretoria, but I have been working um, in the UK for about 26 years. And I'm the I'm tri qualified lawyer and founder of Audio International. And we work across um, internationally and across sectors, really uh, supporting business in developing their policies and their due diligence procedures and their training to tackle um, issues around human rights, forced labor, modern slavery, and child labor. Now, I was um, really privileged to uh, meet Matthias Thorns and Rita from the IOE last year, and we discussed an opportunity to do some collaboration together, looking at um, uh, undertaking some research to see how companies are actually addressing child labor and what are some of the um, effective and key features of a child labor due diligence program. Um, and I know Matthias is going to address us uh, after I have uh, spoken to you all. So over the last four months, we've spent quite a bit of time um, in the development of the research around this particular paper, which we're going to release, I will let you know, probably in, in a few months' time. I, I just want to say as a caveat, when we uh, started the research is, uh, let me just click to the next slide if I've got it right. Uh, no, there we go. Um, so just to say, in terms of today and what I want to share with you, we hope that this is actually the start of a conversation and a start of an opportunity to actually dig deeper. You'll see from um, our methodology that actually we uh, had a 36-question survey. It was also translated um, into Spanish and French, and we um, circulated amongst the IOE membership as well as amongst Audia, um, our, our, our clients. We didn't have a massive uptake, but I'm using some of the um, responses to that survey as part of the discussion today and to, and to, and to really share what we, we think some of the findings are slightly um, informative, perhaps of things that may not be happening, even though it's indicative in the survey that um, some of the companies who addressed it, for example, under mapping, have said that they do a, a lot of extensive mapping. Alongside the survey, we undertook a desk review. Um, this desk review was quite extensive. We looked at a number of benchmarking uh, results like Know the Chain. We looked at the UN Global Compact communication progresses. Um, and uh, we looked at, um, i trying to think of the third one. But we looked at these particular benchmarks to assess what companies were doing. And from them, we then did a deeper dive into some of the other companies and we did some one-to-one -one interviews. So as I said, this to me is just the start of um, gathering information. It's, it, it would be what I, what I hope we can do with this is, is actually try and galvanize more interest in the questions and the findings so that actually what we ultimately are able to produce is something that becomes very practicable for business. Now, what I really actually just want to hone in on, I, I probably for most of you, you are very familiar with, sorry, my clicking is really bad, my, very familiar with the OECD um, guidelines and what is seen as um, effective due diligence. And we use this as a framework to, to um, 
dig deeper into what we thought companies should be at least speaking about or evidencing in their reports and in their communications. And what we've come up with is um, we, we've set out the what green. we see as 10 key features of effective due diligence. Some of these features actually speak to what we've already heard from the earlier speakers. So they speak to uh, prevention, they speak to mitigation, they speak to remediation. Um, and I'll just go through them very briefly. Um, you, can, you can read them, you can, you'll certainly be able to get them when we um, share the paper. But I think critically, setting um, the tone through policy commitments is something that I don't feel should ever be undervalued. Because the work that I've seen in the last 10 years working with business is that having an established policy commitment is the very first entry point into cultural change. And actually, we need cultural change around these issues where we, are, we see businesses taking their duty to respect um, seriously, where we see that they embed a culture of actually ensuring that their supply chains are transparent, that they're responsible, and, um, and, and to tackle things like child rape. Mapping um, value chains is, is another feature that we felt is, is really critical to identify and assess and take action against child labor. And um, I'll share with you one of the survey results, but actually it's something in practice that we don't see that often. We don't see extensive mapping taking place. Perhaps as we um, see the drive in the EU and European due diligence legislation, which requires mapping and is value chain based or supply chain based, we might see further uptake of this, but it's critical to understand where the risks are and then how you're going to address them. Stakeholder engagement that is continuous, we think is critical. We see that in good practices, those organizations that really understand who their stakeholders are and actually have a plan of how they continuously engage with them. Really important is how businesses invest in social mobility um, initiatives. And again, this was alluded to in the previous conversations. It's understanding the root causes of um, child labor and then actually investing into social mobility initiatives. And these will vary depending on specific issues. For example, access to education or minimum wage or um, broader issues. So again, tend to be sector specific and tend to be um, also different in terms of different cultures. Um, Colleen, if, if how you much want time? To, if you, yeah, we're running out of time. And if you want to use your green button okay. to move uh, your slides, okay. that um, might work. And okay. we have to then I, so can I go back? So I, I won't then, I, as, as time is limited, I mean, you'll be able to see what we've see, set out as these 10 initiatives. But I think, you know, what, what I see from practice, perhaps to pull out on this, is that um, we really need much more emphasis on effective grievance mechanisms and, and, a, and appropriate remediation processes. I continue to be surprised by how many organizations think that just having a hotline or whistleblowing line is effective. I think that, you know, in my own experience of working with child labor and forced labor issues is that really coming to terms with remediation protocols and how you react and deal with um, the finding of child labor, forced labor is, is really key. Um, <clears throat> And I think that uh, the investment into also early warning mechanisms, and, and what I mean by that is things like worker voice technology, working more closely with trade unions, working with um, stakeholders on the ground is going to become more critical to develop really effective remediation processes. So just in the interest of time, I'll skip through the other um, features. And I just wanted to highlight some of the findings in the survey. Now, again, bearing in mind, this was a very small sample set. And the conversation we were having beforehand with um, some of the members on the panel and with the IOE is that they seemed quite surprising. You know, for those people who, were, um, who, who answered or responded to our survey, there was a very high percentage that have said they've mapped um, their supply chain and, um, and actually uh, understand their risk and addressing it. In practice, we don't really see that. And I'd be really interested to hear from the other participants in this panel today and perhaps in the questions and answer whether 
you know, what they take is on those particular survey findings. I have to put my, my glasses on now. Um, the second one is um, the question of how far are businesses mapping beyond the first tier and, um, and if that's aligned to contractual relationships. I think um, a less than 50% are saying they've done that. I think that's probably more reflective of practice. Um, I uh, was training some, some organizations this morning and um, we were asking some questions around mapping as well and actually uh, in this particular uh, training session, the, the, the represented by 15 global companies, uh, the, the response to mapping beyond tier one was even lower than that. Um, continued use of stakeholder engagement. So this was one of the key features that we pulled out. And you'll see again um, what the re survey responses have been, um, less than 60% really that are um, using stakeholder community engagement as part of their company's processes and developing policy and effective solutions. I think this point goes to companies not really understanding um, the, the requirement that you put rights holders first when you look at business and human rights. I think there's very often still a, a view of looking at these issues from a business risk perspective only, not a human rights perspective. And, and I'd be interested again if, the, if we develop this further to see how that might change in, in years as people understand perhaps their own um, obligations around business and human rights better. I mean, we have to wrap up. Okay, and, um, and then I think uh, the last slide anyway was around monitoring, remediation, again you'll see they're quite low, we're not seeing anything in terms of, you know, upper two, two thirds or, you know, 70% around some of these issues. Um, I was interested around the remediation procedures being as high as 50%, given uh, my own experience in practice. And, and the last point I just want to make is that actually um, disengagement should be seen as a last resort. And we've actually pulled that out as a key feature because I think that it's all too easy for business to simply disengage. We saw um, what happened with Dyson earlier this year, disengaging from um, supply chain in Malaysia. and. Um, I think that by understanding disengagement as being a last resort also will perhaps force companies to think more clearly around what are the position if, if child labor is found and actually how they deal with remediation. So um, I think I need to end there, Catherine, and I look forward to your answer or your questions. I look forward to the panel perhaps um, commenting on these different um, side of things. And, and lastly, just to say, please, if you want to know more about the webinars we run and the work we're doing, and if you want a copy of the last, the white paper, please sign up to our website. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colleen, for that interesting presentation. And Rich, I, there will be tons of questions I think we, we'll come to ask you, and I'm actually burning to ask them now, but I'm going to hold them and I hope you all are ready to hold it for a few minutes because I'm sure there's a lot of reactions about the numbers we have seen, whether that corresponds to the realities of your own work, the work you're doing in companies, in civil society, in trade unions, um, with uh, UN organizations. So I'm going to hold that for a while, but I will come back to you during the Q&A session. So please Keep your questions for Colleen on your mind because we, we're coming back on that. And I want to now move to uh, listening directly to those businesses that are actually engaging to tackle child labor in their supply chain. So we're going to now move from perspective and hear directly from those that are making it happen within companies. I have therefore the pleasure to invite to this uh, panel two speakers, Michael Okorafor, he is the Chief Sustainability Officer of McCormick. Michael, thank you so much for waiting for so long to have this conversation. Oh. I think that's already a great proof of your commitment to be part of the solution. So thank you a lot. And thanks a lot as well for her patience to Inge Jacobs. Inge, it's great to have you. I know you just arrived from a long trip. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us. You are Senior Manager, Human Rights and Income at Mars. Welcome to this fifth global conference on the elimination of child labor. And thank you for bringing the business perspective to the conversation. 
It's great to have you. And I, I see you big on this screen. Wonderful. <laughs> OK. Thank so, you. Thanks. Thanks to both. So let me start by, by throwing a, a question that it's three questions in one. But we wanted to capture a little bit of what you're currently doing, what's happening right now in, in, in your efforts on tackling child labor. So my first question to you is, first of all, from your perspective, where are you where you're sitting currently? And you're actually in big companies, big multinational companies that have a long supply chain, focusing a lot of your raw materials in agriculture, where we know 70% of child labor is. So there's a critical role that you are playing within the agro-industry business um, in, in your own position. So what are the challenges? What makes you uh, lose some of your sleep when you try to actually tackle child labor in your own supply chain. And let me add, how are you working with others to fix those challenges? Is that collaboration happening? Is it working the way you want to work? So over to you now. I know it's a, it's a three questions in one, but uh, businesses sometimes like to have products that encompasses. So I know it's a good challenge for both of you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, I also want to recognize uh, Marilou Dupont for really creating this environment for us to participate. So let me first of all tell you, um, I, as you uh, formally introduced me, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at McCormick, which means I'm responsible for everything around sustainability. Uh, including our supply chain, which you know is deep in agriculture, including our plant operations, including our human uh, 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 capabilities, as well as packaging. So all of that is enveloped in my responsibility. So I think one of the things I will start with you that is keeping me awake at night. So I always like to go to the end of the uh, question, and then I come back. The thing that is keeping me awake at night is you have to understand my background. And to whom much is given, much should be expected. So let me, first of all, for transparency, explain to people, I grew up in some of the communities similar to where McCormick sources. As you know, McCormick is, uh, is the number one uh, uh, marketer of uh, herbs and spices and seasonings in the world. We have so many brands. And believe it or not, we source from small communities small farm level communities. So when you talk about smallholder farmers, we get it. That's how we've sustained our business for so long. And we've actually made a declaration, which we call purpose-led performance, which means we have to continue to deliver top tier financial performance while doing the right thing for our people, our communities, and the planet we all share. And the key thing there is the communities. When we talk about communities, we're talking about communities where we live, where we work, but more importantly, where we source. And that's where the thing hits home to me. I grew up in the eastern part of Nigeria, and my mother was a subsistence farmer. And I can tell you this. I will not be here today without that woman. When he lost her husband when I was four years old, she raised four children single-handedly as a farmer and was able to send me to an all-boys Catholic boarding school that changed the trajectory of my life. And that is where I feel I should give back much to this community, this farming community that raised me. And what a great thing to work for a company that empowers and believes in that commitment. That's really what brings me here. Let me tell you what we're doing in those farming communities. We issued this in our purpose-led performance report uh, about five years ago, and we're continuing to make progress in that. One, the importance of those farming communities means that, one, we have to improve the livelihood in those communities, building resilience, which is measured by capacity and capability building. Two, women empowerment, something dear to my heart. Eliminating predatory activities that has plagued farming communities, smallholder farming communities. And believe it or not, those, uh, uh, those problems, those uh, predatory fast, uh, activities that plagued them when I was growing up still exist today. And that's shameful. And that is the thing that we are determined to eliminate. And I'll tell you how we're doing that. Third is really, uh, really making sure that women have enough to engage in their own farms 
and raise their children like my mother raised me. I cannot see anything more important than that. And these things are interrelated. When you look at a, a woman that is farming on her farm, like my mom, you know, her interest is making sure this child is going to school. If the school is uh, three miles away, that's not good. So one of the things we're doing in places like Madagascar and in India and, and Indonesia is we're trying to locate schools closer to the farm. So the woman doesn't have to leave her, her farm for a long time to go check out the child if the child is sick. So all those things are what we're doing. But more importantly is having women own the farms. When I was growing up, most of the farms were owned by men. Most of the workers, women, like my mother. So we're about to change that. So we, we know that we're not experts in understanding these things. We hired the NGO Care International to really go to those communities and understand the issues that are holding women back. They did that. And some of the results I shared in the WIFI conference uh, in, in Dubai just before COVID was very revealing. You know what is happening is these women cannot access capital. They do most of the work at home. They take, most of, take care of the kids. And how do you enable them to do that? So what did we do? In Madagascar, I'm going to be specific in certain regions. In Madagascar, by the way, Madagascar produces 80% of the world's global natural vanilla. Important country to all of us. So when you eat your ice cream with vanilla or cook with vanilla, think about Madagascar. We're thinking about it. So one of the things they identified and we took action was one, these women need to own their own farms. How do you own your own farms when you have middlemen taking most of the money? So we eliminated the middlemen and allowed the farmers to form what we call cooperatives. And we hired another NGO, NCBA Clusa, to work and create in this cooperatives so that these farmers can set their own prices and get all the money, not just the middlemen that we used to call henchmen when I was growing up. So we're eliminating that, three middlemen, and you have thousands of farmers now keeping their own money. And we commit to buying it at a premium because they are following McCormick practices, meaning no child labor or forced labor. It's not just child labor, but forced labor. We're trying to eliminate that. And what you see in those communities now, they are thriving. I'd like to refer you to the UNG, uh, to the um, COP26 video that Samantha Power made. Samantha Power is the administrator of the um, <coughs> USAID. She cited the work that McCormick was doing in Madagascar and how we're improving lives and impacting climate. So we're taking a holistic approach on that. The last thing that I want to make, and I will pause there, is this idea of living income. We call it living wage. One of the things that happened is when people own their own farms, they can make money. So one of the things we did, we enabled the VSLA, Village Sevens and Loan, to really make loans to these women so they can start their own farms. Guess what we did? We paid the interest upfront so that these women will start their own farms. And by the way, that means they can do the work and keep all the money. And they don't need to have their children go and work on those farms, but they need to keep them in school. We build those schools, we have furnished them. And I can tell you today, if you go down to Madagascar or even Vietnam and see what is happening, you'll be very happy. Again, we're on a journey. I know we haven't done it everywhere, but we will continue to be on this journey because we're seeing results. And by the way, our results are improving as a result of that. During the COVID pandemic, we didn't lose a bit because these farmers were working diligently. So I pause there unless there is any question and then we can continue. Thank you very much. You're on mute. Catherine, I think I'll jump in. Yeah? Do you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, good. So, Michael, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. The audience would have a lot of questions. Our co-chairs from the COP probably will have questions. So, thanks a lot for that. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, that bringing that angle of non-discrimination of gender equality is clearly part of the solution. As all of you know, the fundamental principles and rights at work include non-discrimination as an enabling right, like freedom of association and collective bargaining, to access other rights and to fight against child labor. So, thanks for bringing that angle of gender empowerment, gender equality, putting women 
on the front of this fight. Thanks a lot for that. And we'll come back on some of the challenges, because I also want to hear about the challenges. Inge, now we want to hear from you. What, doesn't, what prevents you from, from sleeping at night when you're trying to tackle child labor in your supply chain? And how are you working with others? How that, converse, that collaboration is actually leading to an impact? Thanks, Catherine, and good to see you on stage, actually. <laughs> uh, so I will speak about our cocoa uh, supply chain specifically, because even though, you know, Mars buys hundreds of raw materials across the world, and there's many teams such as, uh, or people such as myself working on different uh, topics, uh, I'll speak about cocoa because that's what I know best. Uh, I'm our lead human rights expert working on the cocoa supply chain. Uh, we actually buy cocoa in, in many different continents on different countries and through a network of suppliers. And I would say one of the biggest challenges challenge I have, and, and for quite a large company such as Mars, is the scale of our operations. I think the number of countries and suppliers we source from requires us to be very focused and flexible to adapt to every context. And it, it really requires us to have what we call boost. Uh, and to have a very close relationship with our suppliers who are the link to the farming communities that we, that we source from. But that also requires us to collaborate with different expert partners because you know every context is different, every country is different, and we need to approach each one of them with, with tailored approaches and partnerships um, that will have to be different and focus on different key issues. Um, so what we do you know, to, to ensure that we have visibility of the risks across our supply chain and, and respond to them as appropriate, um, we expect all our suppliers, obviously, to conduct their due diligence. We, we facilitate trainings. We provide them with the guidance and tools that they need to build their capabilities uh, on, on monitoring, prevention, and remediation. Um, we are also mapping our entire supply chain and ensuring traceability of the cocoa that we buy. Um, we have ambitious targets by 2025, so that keeps me awake at night sometimes. <laughs> um, but to do that, to do all that and to reach that scale, um, we have to collaborate. And so we're working with, you know, in COCO, there's the International COCO Initiative that works on, on pilots and research and developing best practices to tackle child and forced labor. And we also work with NGO partners who have the expertise uh, to help us build those capabilities across our supply chain. And Verite is our expert partner on responsible labor practice and I'm sure Michael at McCormick, you know, we have very similar partners um, out there. Um, one of the second challenges I think I want to talk about, uh, and Colleen alluded to it in her presentation, is related to what I find is the imbalance between monitoring and mapping risks on one hand and the remediation on the other hand. And Michael talked quite a bit about the remediation and the VSLAs and everything that needs to happen to address some of the root causes, which is also something that Mars is doing. But I find that you know, due diligence and the, 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 the effort or the focus on monitoring has allowed the cocoa sector to have a much better understanding of what the problems are. And, you know, it's not news to anybody, but child labor is actually a symptom of, of deeply entrenched root causes. And, and poverty is actually one of the main one and, and the hardest one to solve. And so that is also something that keeps me awake because, you know, no one has found a solution to poverty. So um, what I find is that, you know, we should be careful in, in, in investing too much or focusing too much on only the monitoring element of due diligence. I find we have to shift our focus now to, to focus much more heavily on prevention and remediation of the root causes. And, um, you know, there's a point that we all know what the issues are in, in cocoa, for example, in the cocoa supply chain. The more difficult question is how do we address those risks sustainably and how do we make these, these monitoring efforts more efficient and effective so we can focus more on remediation. And there again, you know, that's where the collaboration comes in. We can't do this on our own. We need partners to, to drive change across the sector. And sometimes, you know, it, it takes time and patience to align everyone around a common vision and, and framework, uh, you know, more than, than we would want sometimes. But I feel like in the cocoa sector, there is really some movement happening. I always compare it to a cruise ship that, or a container ship that you have to move. You know, it's slow, but once it moves in the right direction, it's really, it, it goes in the right direction. So again, we partner with NGOs as well, such as CARE, uh, and whom we rely on to address some of the root causes. Um, and then obviously we also have to engage with the governments. I think that's really critical, especially if we want to enable or create that enabling environment that will help us sustainably reduce um, the risk.
And maybe two final lessons I wanted, lessons learned I wanted to share is having boots on the ground has been really important for us, having people who understand the context, who, you know, we have to stay close if we want to make sure that we understand what really is happening on the ground. And so you need local teams that work hand in hand with suppliers, with NGOs, to continuously monitor and improve our actions on, on the ground. And one final one is, you know, it's always very easy to criticize and to blame the big multinationals or the big companies. But believe me that if someone came up with a golden solution, we would all have taken it up and, and run with it. So my lesson here is really it's important that we all join hands because that's how we will get much further. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Inge. And thanks so much for putting the emphasis on really working much more on prevention and remediation. And it is true that shifting that big monitoring vote to a slightly and more and more different direction takes time and takes effort to join everybody uh, on, on that road. But I think there are a lot of companies and efforts going on that way. And clearly, the ILO Child Labor Platform um, is, is very much uh, looking forward to support that effort at the country level. Boots on the ground, I think that's an interesting and important point that you're highlighting. Lots of due diligence happens really on the top of the companies, using desk research, looking at different research that has been done. And actually, very few companies are taking the time and investment to look on the ground, the realities, to engage with civil society, with trade unions, with cooperatives, with the community itself, to understand the local context. So we definitely need to scale up the, the footprint we have in local communities to empower them and, and to find with them the solutions. I'm going to jump now to a second question because time is precious. We don't have that much time and, and we're happy to have you here and, and be frank about the challenges and the solutions. So the second question I, I want to bring you forward, it's let's talk about after Durban and what are you planning actually to to do with others to scale up what works already within your supply chain. So you have mentioned a few examples of what's already actually having an impact on the ground for children, that are already having some incipient or strong potential to tackle root causes. So I want to ask you both, how do you scale up? Or how are you planning to scale up your successful interventions? What's the role of businesses in general to scale that successful intervention? And what are you hoping that others can contribute with? So, uh, Michael, let's start with you sure. and then we end with Inge. <clears throat> sure. Um, first of all, there is a simple concept that we believe. This area of work is a pre-competitive area. That means we cannot go it alone. Inge will tell you, we have a partnership with Mars on some areas. And we have a partnership, a partnership with PepsiCo on other areas and so forth, several companies. But one of the things we've done is in this particular uh, family, more impact in smallholder farmers, again, as I say, similar to my mother. And I'm very proud of her. And that's why I'm here today. In this particular area, we've created what we call grown for good. Because every time you talk about helping farmers, what we want to do is help them only on farm level activities. Like we are partners with RFA, Rainforest Alliance and that kind of thing. That is not sufficient to teach them how to farm. What is more important is addressing the three areas of resilience in those communities, which means proactive work on understanding what needs to be done, be done, Two, the idea I talked about the gender equality in the agricultural community so that women can own their own farms, all right? All right. And the third one is really ethical supply chain. So one of the things we've done with this Grown for Good is a standard, the first in our industry, in the herbs and spice industry. And it has gained FSA silver recognition. So what have we done? So where we have allowed uh, these farmers who practice all these things, meaning eliminating child labor and doing much more than that. You, you know, if you don't get to the fundamental causes, the rudimentary causes of these problems, you're not going to make progress. And I can tell you, having grown up in that community, it's like 
it's, it comes to life to me every time. When I go into these communities, it's like I'm going home. In fact, I feel more at home in the farming community on the farm than in my corporate office. That's the type of mindset you have to adopt so that you can make real changes. Two, you have to make sure that you don't go this alone. Since you are in Durban, I'm going to remind you of the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That is the, what I mean by pre-competitive space. In order to go far and advance this goal of eliminating, eradicating all these predatory and child labor practices in, in, that has existed for centuries in communities that I grew up in, we have to go together. So we are making open our ground for good for people to leverage. It is the first in our industry, in the herbs and spice industry, and so we're making it available. We issued it in our public uh, uh, disclosure in our PLP report, Purpose Led Performance Report. Remember I told you we created that. And we issued that there so that people can see it. And people are now reaching out to us to learn what they can do and partnering with the same NGOs that we work with, CARE, UNGC. I also like to remind you we work with the IDH in the in, uh, Netherlands and we work with the uh, the German agency as well. So these are partners, and they are, in some cases, co-funding what we're doing because it makes sense. It's making an impact. So I'd like to tell you that we are really committed to sharing this. We're not keeping it to ourselves, and we don't think it will make sense to keep it to any one company. So uh, I will pass it on to uh, Inge because I think some of the discussions you're seeing us have here is really something that is genuine, and for me, it hits home. This is a personal mission for me as well. I have to end up with that so that it, people don't get confused. I'm not doing this for work. I think, as I said, the thing that keeps me awake at night is to whom much is given, growing up on a farm in the eastern part of Nigeria and being where I am in the C-suite for a global company today, people should expect much from me and from my company. Inge? Thanks, Michael. Catherine, can I jump in? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I like how you framed it, Michael, of being at a personal mission. I think every one of us working in this space shares this mission, right, and, and are very mission-driven. And I have seen that even work, I was always working in NGOs before, but coming into the private sector, it's been really eye-opening to see how many people really want to drive change and want to do good. And I think um, what I would add on, on what Michael said, another element that can help, you know, skills, due diligence, and make sure that more and more uh, companies work on it is, is the EU, for example, the EU uh, corporate sustainability due diligence uh, legislation that is being de de debated and developed as we speak has some great potential as well. I think it's quite groundbreaking in its potential and might be a strong push, um, you know, to create a shared expectation and, and level the playing field. Because I think, you know, the big ones, the big companies are always in, in the spotlight, but there's many other companies there that actually everyone needs to join. Uh, the movement and needs to um, have the due diligence in, in place. Um, I would agree with Michael as well that I think we really need to focus on, on the remediation and, and creating that enabling environment. Uh, and for us, that's, you know, working with governments, but also promoting and, and working on setting up public and private partnerships that will allow us to have sector-wide initiatives be put in place, because that's the only way we will be able to address the, the, the root causes of the problems we are facing and that the cocoa farming families are facing. It's not by continuously monitoring and only doing monitoring. I'm not saying it's not important. We not have to understand what the risks are and what the problems are in the supply chain. But monitoring can just be one element. The, the key element is really how do we address some of the, of the root causes. Um, I think, you know, in these, in these partnerships and in this collaboration, it's really looking at clear roles and responsibilities. We all have to acknowledge we have a role to play. Government has their role. Industry has their role. Um, we shouldn't be, or you know, outsiders shouldn't be expecting the industry to solve all the problems in the world. Um, it, we have a responsibility, definitely, and we want to take that up. But there's many other players, you know, even the civil society, the NGOs. We want them to to think out of the box, be creative, come up with with solutions because they have a foot on the ground and they know what is what is happening. I think two two other last things I want to say is as as companies, we really need to increase 
is what we call our, our direct sourcing and transparency in our supply chains. Because as long as we buy, you know, in, indirectly and on the market and without knowing where the cocoa, co for example, in the, in this, in the, on cocoa, as long as we don't know where our cocoa comes from, we have too many blind spots. And so for us, that's going to be a really big push by 2025, where we want all our cocoa to be um, responsibly sourced, meaning traceable. Um, and then one last thing I would like to mention and throw out there, Catherine, is, is really the, how do we measure success and impact? And I feel internally at Mars as well, we're looking at, okay, how can we show impact, uh, you know, and what are our key indicators of success? And there again, I don't have a, a final answer or a solution, but I want us to move away from counting cases that, you know, it's, it's really looking at what will improve the well-being and the livelihoods of, um, of farming families. Uh, not only, you know, have we found a child with a sharp tool and has that child stopped using that sharp tool because Michael knows, and I have lived in, in Africa for more than 30 years myself. I mean, some of these tools are just part of life. And so it's yeah. not something that you can just remediate uh, by doing one awareness raising session. You know, it's, it's the whole environment that needs to, yeah. to change or be improved. Um, Thank you. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank so, you. So Catherine, Thank you, before Yes. Before you leave, I think uh, Inge makes a, a very good point. At the end of the day, and this is how we feel, nobody really cares about what we do. What people care about is the impact of what we do. So if you're talking about measurement, don't measure what you do. Measure the impact. That's a critical comment that uh, Inge, I want to amplify that. So I'm going to stop at that. And that's exactly what we're doing on the ground. And when we say we're eliminating predatory activities so people can keep the bulk of the money, that's the impact. These women can now send their kids to school, similar to my, what my mom sent me to. So if you want to see how success looks like, I say, look at my mother. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, one farmer at a time. It's not about what we're doing, the impact of what we do. Thank you both. This is really rich, fascinating, and we're getting really concrete suggestions from both of you. The focus on measuring impact is critical, and I see many of our partners also in this room that are looking at exactly one of those questions, measuring impact. How do we measure impact on attacking child labor in supply chains? I really like also the topic about public-private partnership. I think we really need to be more ambitious on that. It is time to just get ambitious and get it done on public-private partnerships. It's really important. And then what businesses are doing to change business models, as Inge mentioned re regarding direct sourcing, that definitely would contribute to understand risks, to prevent and mitigate them much faster. This has been rich, and I wish we could continue speaking with both of you. But one thing I want to do now is I want to give the floor to our co-chairs, the co-chairs of the CLP, the IUE and ITUC. I know uh, my both of our co-chairs will forgive me because I'm giving you both the floor before it was planned. Uh, but you have been being extremely patient and also listening to our speakers. So let's hear from you, what are your first reactions about this conversation? What's the first or the very few messages that you're taking from here and that you want to discuss? And then we're going to quickly move to the audience. So here in Durban, those who have questions, get ready because we still have time for good questions to be brought to our speakers and our global audience. Please send us your question. Marilu will bring your voices here. So. Um, Let's start with Matthias. Uh, Matthias, thanks for joining us. Um, you are actually the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of IOE. You're also the co-chair of the ILO Child Labor Platform. So Matthias, what's your impression about this conversation? What do you take from this conversation? Thank you very much. And it was really fascinating. It was really happy to be in a lot of stuff to comment on. I think the first one is about the collective action to address the root causes. And we heard from Michael what we do in order to give access to finance to female entrepreneurs, access to education, access to market. And I think that's critical. And as Inga has said, this cannot be done by one company alone. First of all, access to education, access to it's a task of the government, you know, it is the responsibility of government, but more importantly, it is really where everyone can work together. And the CLP, the child layer platform, as um, Catherine has said, can play a critical role here. So everyone who is in the room and you are a company, you are interested in collective action, please contact Catherine after this meeting. She really can advise you how to engage better. 
The issue about having boots on the ground, I fully agree with it. But the challenge here, of course, is that many small companies don't have the resources like Mars, right? And it starts actually much earlier. If you're a medium-sized company and you are having many countries where you are sourcing from, where do you, you know, where you start? Do you not have even a telephone number who to call? with whom you should engage, with whom you could partner. And I think there's a real need if you want to scale up meaningful due diligence, meaningful engagement, to have an easy, accessible place where companies can go. And these need to be where they trust. We, from the IE side, at the moment, trying to establish such a help desk, a help desk not to help government uh, companies to say what due diligence is. Now, there's a lot of guidance out but where they can find easy information on what are the risks in a certain country, how to engage, who are the stakeholders they should speak to, who are partners they should uh, on and so forth. And I think that is a real mean in order to promote it. The European directive, I don't want to comment on it because the corporate responsibility and to respect human rights, of course, includes due diligence. That's not a question. The danger is, and we heard it before also, that then if there's a liability clause, which is foreseen at the moment, companies will be too scared to stay. They will cut and run because they don't want to become liable for what happens in the supply chain, particularly if you're a smaller one. So this cut and run automatically becomes a huge danger as soon as there's a liability clause for um, supply chain um, dangers. And that needs to be taken into account under the unintended consequences of such a um, legislation. Because what we see is who will suffer are not the companies, are not the consumer in Europe or the US, who will suffer are the people on the ground. Because no child 